Um, uh, bon revoir. Welcome. Uh, we are going to be talking about uh, Yiddish in Belarus and what we can do with Yiddish. Why is Yiddish important to get to know Jewish Belarus? How is, how is, is it very, very relevant? And we will show you a couple of, um, uh, like, um, we will um, um, show a couple of uh, authors that are very important in the Yiddish world and all, also uh, other um, intellectuals that are very important in the Jewish world in general. So I hope you uh, will enjoy this uh, next minutes. Um, my nomin is Tamara, my name is Tamara, and I, I'm a PhD student at UCL University. And uh, we will be discussing about Yiddish. So I would like to um, start by asking everyone, um, if the um, host can unmute everybody, or if you prefer to use the chat, what are the reasons, why do you think Yiddish would be relevant to get to know Jewish Belarus? So I would like you to give me a couple of ideas. Why so, would that put, so put your answers in the chat and then as people come up with things, I'll unmute them and you can say it to the whole room. Okay, excellent. So if you want, you could uh, add a couple of things, one word, you can add one sentence. Why do you think Yiddish is relevant to get to know Jewish Belarus? Or maybe, maybe not, if you think it's not. Yeah, maybe you, you can, can explain. say it's completely relevant because this or that. Does everybody know how to use the chat? If you don't know how to use the chat, please send me a message. Oh, well, that's, let me explain it to you now. If you didn't know how to use the chat, you couldn't send me a message. So what you do is you go down to the bottom of your screen and there should be a small icon in the shape of a speech bubble. Uh, oh, but I so think that, yeah, I think that uh, they cannot, um, they can only send messages privately. So we'll have to change our idea. So instead so of- They can send them to me and I can send them to you. Oh, people okay. Can, people can message me privately, um, yeah, that's I believe. Right. And, and then you I'll just, can, I'll tell you them. You can read them aloud as well. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I have a few here from Gleb Pradyonov to revive our history, heritage, to trace the history of our close ancestors. Yes, that's great. Another thing that we have seen is that uh, to speak with older generations, uh, we don't speak Russian, unfortunately. We will learn it, I hope. But in order to speak to, for example, to Frida, a, a ghetto survivor from Minsk, we realized that she speaks Yiddish and we had a a direct contact so we were not mm, uh, needing any translations and when we were in the shul in the synagogue uh, in Minsk in the in the orthodox one we also met um, some old, say, older people that were speaking in Yiddish and with whom we were able to have a direct contact so it's useful for uh, getting to know people there uh, having a, a conversation um, even it's useful to get to know more about Jewish history because most of the primary sources that have to do with Jewish Belarus will be in Yiddish. Why? I've got one. I've got one extra from um, Carl Kaplan who says his relatives' names were Yiddish, and uh, another from David Hyatt who says there must be a huge amount of historical materials in Yiddish in the Belarusian archives. Excellent. That's that's one of the main reasons. Historical, uh, most of the primary sources, the sources that we can uh, get to learn more about Jewish history, a lot of them are in Yiddish. A lot of, especially those sources that have to do with internal communication, with uh, different groups that were writing to each other, with, uh, for example, cultural history, with social history, we'll be able to access the newspapers, and the newspapers are going to be mainly in Yiddish. Not all the, all the Jewish intellectuals were using Yiddish, but a lot of them, and the, um, the common people, were, they were definitely using Yiddish. So we will share the screen. We will share, um, um, uh, we, will, we have, be able, we have to have the permission to share it. Is it possible? Mm -hmm. And we will show you a couple of things that have to do with authors. And um, yes, of course. So I'll, I'll get that sorted for you now. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, or is it all? So what we'll what we do while we uh, prepare that? I'll just explain quickly. Uh, we'll present a 
uh, we'll continue talking uh, a bit about this uh, Yiddish in Belarus in general. And then we will have the opportunity to listen to uh, Gleb Rodionov. When we finish, he will introduce himself, uh, who will give more like a, a specific uh, notion of why and how Yiddish, in his case, using his own research, has been uh, useful. Uh, so, uh, and we will finish with uh, after Gleb. But before we talk about a specific authors that that wrote in Yiddish and that were uh, that are fundamental to understand Yiddish life and uh, Yiddish uh, and Jewish poetry and what was going on in Eastern Europe, I would just like to uh, say that uh, Yiddish was the main language they, that they well it was the language they they were speaking and actually at some point they decided. It could be a national language, not in terms of a national state, but a language that should be empowered, should have like an academia, and that was when Yivova was founded. And um, one very important date for that is 1908 with the Chernovitz Conference, where a lot of Yiddish intellectuals from different places got together and decided and talked about Yiddish and about the importance of having a Jewish culture Embed, embed in the in the language in the Jewish language that was um, that is Yiddish. So now uh, Jews in Belarus, Yiddish speakers, weren't only living in a shtetl, uh, praying and uh, you know like fiddler on the roof kind of thing. Yes, that was of course an important uh, uh, part of of Jewish life and culture, but they were. Uh, there, there were literary movements, artistic movements, intellectuals, uh, all sorts of political activists, uh, religious people, religious leaders, uh, Zionists, anti-Zionists, workers, communists, anti-communists, all sorts of people. And that's one of the great uh, things about uh, Jews in, in Belarus. They, are, they were and they are so diverse. And uh, Yiddish is a great way, it's a window, uh, that we can, uh, you can look through it and see things more directly. Because if they tell them to you in English, or if you read about them in English, or if you go to a heritage trip and everything is just in English or, or the local language, then yes, you may learn a lot. But as a Yiddish speaker, I can tell you, you very often arrive in places where the plaque is only in, let's say, Russian and Yiddish. Uh, that, yeah, that's the thing, especially in uh, Minsk and the area around it, and in other places like uh, Bronya Goraya that, that we went to, the plaque was in Russian and in Yiddish. So we were able also to, like, we don't, unfortunately, we don't need, we don't read Russian, but we were able to, to read the plaque and understand what they were saying. And sometimes we do find a little bit of a difference of how the narrative about the Holocaust is being written in Yiddish and in Russian. For example, the plaque in Yiddish may say, uh, uh, 30,000 Jews were killed here, but the Russian one will say, uh, 50,000 Soviet victims were killed here because they added the Jews and the others and this and that and blah blah. So it's 50,000 Soviets without the Jewish specific thing. This is with the Holocaust only. Yeah, so we, we decided to start the presentation with, um, with whom? Who, uh, who can tell us or, well, what uh, about what, what artist is being? Um, portrayed here. Only one of these is not that artist. So who would like to tell us who is this artist? Or write in the chat. Yeah, maybe. Okay, so this uh, we it's uh, it's several fragments of paintings by Chagall, and it will say, oh, Chagall is well renowned uh, because of his painting uh, paintings. And what we're going to see is that uh, well, what what is also interesting to see is how much he also drew for Yiddish books, and he even wrote um, a poem about Vitebsk, his uh, birthplace, in Yiddish. So he was collaborating with other Yiddish authors uh, to make drawings. Um, his wife was a Yiddish writer, and and she this, uh, the, the, just this town below, next to the woman, uh, that's uh, Sutin, which is another 
Jewish uh, painter from the time, also a Yiddish speaker, also very important, also in the greatest museums in the world. Uh, he was also a Litvak, etc. Et so, uh, uh, so he wasn't the only, uh, th th there were more, it, it was a lively uh, scene. Yeah, so uh, here in this map, we can see different uh, cities of Belarus. And if we look at every city, we will find a Yiddish folklore song related to it, or an, an author that was writing in Yiddish in the, at that time, like yeah, for example, he, here in Smorgon, I'm pointing it, uh, I'm pointing a very, very, very famous writers one of them, uh, Avram Tsutskever, was born there. Later, he was a partisan, um, and he was in Vilna Ghetto, and he was writing everything in Yiddish. He immigrated to Israel. So, uh, what we're trying, what it's important to take into account is how much Yiddish was the the main language being spoken there. Not only by by groups like the Bund group, which was um, um, aiming for territorial autonomy, but also by Zionists. And I'll show, we'll show you later one character that um, was very important for Keren Kayemet Le Israel. And he was writing in Yiddish and he was doing a lot of um, his political activism in Yiddish. So it doesn't matter in which municipality of Belarus you look, the amount of material of people that works. Belarus has a disproportionate influence in the world of Yiddish. The amount of people and artists and movements and things that happen there for various political, geographical, etc. reasons make Belarus a very unique place among all the Yiddish lands, so to, if you want to call them like that, Belarus is overrepresented in, in where the poets and the most important people for the language came from. So that's more or less the message we want to... Yeah, and, and not only in the world of Yiddish, but also in the Jewish world. So for example, we, if we see uh, Brest, uh, there were uh, Zionist leaders that were uh, born in Brest. We see that a lot of uh, Bundis were uh, started their activism in, 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 in Belarus. And I wanted to show you this. Um, this is uh, the train station in Minsk, and we can see here in Yiddish, written Minsk, right? We see it in Russian. Um, I would like to ask uh, Uliana, is that Belarusian? Like, because I see that... Uh, yeah, uh, here, the first is in Belarusian, then the first in Russian, then the first in Polish. Is, this is um, in Polish, and then in Yiddish. So we see that amongst uh, the different languages that were spoken in, in Belarus, because at that time there were different minorities. Uh, I suppose the, the Polish were one of the minorities. You also have the Ukrainians. Uh, we see that it was relevant for the, the, the people that were in charge of the train station to write down in Yiddish Minsk. One of the things that makes Belarus so interesting and at the same time different than other countries around in terms of Yiddish is that as opposed to other countries, Belarus did make Yiddish an official language of the state for, an, uh, for, for some years only, but it happened in 24. That means that they gave as much money and investment, etc., to cultural endeavor and education, etc., uh, just like they did for other languages. So there was a Yiddish theater, there, it was like, it was flourishing. So it flourished a, a lot because the state was investing in its, uh, you know, if in your city, 60% uh, of the population was Jewish, then 60% of the, you know, the money that they gave for each uh, community was invested and it ended up, uh, the effect was, in theaters, in publications, in invitations for foreign uh, actors, foreign Yiddish actors. There were in Belarus around 30 troops at the same time traveling around Belarus, presenting in shtetls, in cities. It was lively. And uh, so when it comes to a, a Jewish 
music and Yiddish authors and so on, um, we usually speak about secular uh, Yiddish artists that are well renowned that later on uh, were writing in. So there, ha there okay. So, so that later on were um, translated into Hebrew and into English and so on. But we also see that one of the main um, Yiddish authors that nowadays Hasidim sing and Hasidim uh, have a very special connection is Yom Tov Erlich, who was uh, born in Belarus. Later on, he was in Uzbekistan. He was trying to save himself from war. And um, he nowadays, if you go to a ultra-Orthodox community, uh, especially Hasidim, and you mention Yom Tov Erlich, they will be able to know who that person in, is. In modern standards, Yom Tov Erlich produced 30 albums, 30 albums of Yiddish music and sheet music and notes and, uh, you know, sheet uh, music, I don't know if you say that in English, sorry, when, uh, the, you know the... Um, yeah. yeah, that is correct in English. The, the notes. Uh, so, uh, he influenced Hasidic and religious music, but also half, or I don't know, not half, but a ridiculously high amount of common Yiddish songs that many people know were actually written by him. So yeah, especially like a, a really, a songs that have to do with a festival. With festival. And some of them were even translated into English. So it's it's it, it's even possible that if you if if you happen to go to a Jewish synagogue, a Jewish school, you might have learned a couple of songs. So Sorry, we uh, for interruption we uh, had a question. Yes, uh, from Lee Jackson. Uh, what time period for train train station? And at what period that was uh, before the Second World War? I have to check more exactly the date, but uh, I, w I will usually check. this uh, when they when it says means in Yiddish, or maybe Uliana remembers that uh, when we had the opportunity to visit means with the together plan uh, we uh, we were taken to see a gutter the top of a gutter in the in the in the pavement on the sidewalk on the street was printed you know the metal was also printed in yiddish when this type of things happened it was the 20s when yiddish became an official language of the state then it ceased to be so due to changes in soviet policy then came the, the World War, and then, you know, the Soviet occupation and things were different again. But uh, maybe the picture is not from the 20s, but the idea of writing in public spaces, the, th the names of things in Yiddish alphabet, is a thing uh, that's inherited from that law that was passed in 1924. Great. Um, so we will show you, unfortunately, we don't, we, well, fortunately, we cannot show you everything that has to do with Yiddish and um, and Belarus today because there will be thousands and like there will be a lot a lot of authors that are really that were born in Belarus and were pro producing in Belarus. But one that is very important is Anna Margolin. She uh, it's a modernist Yiddish. Uh, she was a modernist Yiddish poet, and she was born in Brest in the, in the Russian Empire. And later on, she went to New York. She uh, was part of different uh, groups, although she faced, of course, discrimination as a poet peer. And um, she was a part of the movement in Yiddish literature that said that uh, as long as you're writing in Yiddish, you can write about whatever you want. And uh, that's called insichism, introspectivism. So she, together with uh, Janke, Janke uh, Gladstein and others were saying, we don't have to talk only about the shtetl and, and only about the synagogue. We can be writing about going to the museum or about Broadway Street in New York. Because if we're writing it in Yiddish, it's, the, the language is already carrying the Jewish culture and we can write about whatever we or want. about uh, feelings and desire and that was the the the, the central idea of the in sich which in sich means in yourself so it's like having dialogues or monologues or 
thoughts inside you, you know, like as opposed to the outer world. So uh, that's, uh, that's what they mean when they say not, Yiddish is not only for religious things or for this or, or particular topics. It's also for, um, for this. And Anna Margolin is among forget women poets. She's among the most important Yiddish poets ever along other Belarusian women. So pretty much the four among, like four out of the top five, you could say, best and most important women poets in Yiddish history are Belarusian women. Yes, and we have here, um, that if we have time, we'll show that by the end, it's a song uh, that it's called uh, The Golden Epave, or if you want to hear it now, uh, raise your hand and we can see how many people like to hear it. Uh, the, I look for it here, meanwhile. It's The Golden Epave. The Golden Epave usually means uh, literature, and uh, the, it's called the, the Golden, culture, the golden Peacock. It's the Yiddish literature. And it's a, it's a little bit of a sad song that talks about uh, the decline of Yiddish, but um, we, will, we will see a version by Chava Alberstein, which is very good. Have you heard about Chava Alberstein? She's a very, very good uh, singer in Hebrew mainly. A lot of people know her by, because of her songs in Hebrew, but she also has a lot of um, things in Yiddish. So as, as we listen to this beautiful song, you can read the text, and this is by Anna Margolin. Well, well it, it's just a sample because otherwise we won't have a lot of time. Please uh, thumbs up if you can hear the, if you manage to hear the song. One, two, three. And you hear? Is the golden above the flowing, the flowing? On the night of the and the golden flowing. The night of the gaps in the ground, when the fossils are falling and the moon is Great. So we will hear about another Yiddish author, and for that we'll like uh, to uh, left to uh, talk about him because he's the expert on Moshe Kulbach. So Chlev, if you can unmute yourself. I'll unmute him now. We have the, the poem here, Chlev, when you want to read it. Sorry, just looking for Gleb uh, on the list. Ulyana, Gleb a vidish? Yeah, what tosh is shu e unas bo trinatsu chasnik of shas dvinatsit. It looks as though we have lost Lev. I'm not okay. sure what happened. So, so it could be his connection, so we'll leave Moshe Kulbak by the yeah, end we'll in case Cliff uh, can join us. We'll leave it for him. So another very important is Avram Sutkever. I recommend everybody, and it's a uh, uh, um, subtitle, to look at uh, Black Honey. It's a movie that talks about the life of Avram Sutkever. It's in Hebrew and a little bit of Yiddish and English, a lot of English. So it's going to be interesting for everybody. You'll get to learn a little bit about his uh, the, um, early years. And Avram Sutkever is very, very, very important. And um, you, uh, he wrote a lot about uh, Vilna Ghetto. He was in Vilna Ghetto where he lost a uh, son and his mother. And he writes about Ponar and he like the, um, the, the area where most of the Jews from Vilna were killed. 
So uh, through the eyes of Avram Sutskever, we can learn a lot about the Holocaust, but also about what happened afterwards with uh, the Eastern European Jewry, how, how he went to Israel and so on. So he's a very a central character when talking about Yiddish authors in Belarus. We also have Avram Raisin, who is a, a, a famous uh, Yiddish writer. A lot of the songs that we know, like Avram Pripetchik, and like a lot of Yiddish songs were written by him. We have Celia Dropkin. Have you, raise your hand if you have heard about Yiddish erotic poetry. So we have Celia Dropkin, and Celia Dropkin uh, was a very good Yiddish artist, very renowned, very discriminated because she was a woman. The Yiddish uh, literature world was not that different from other environments um, regarding women, but she was uh, very, very good and she wrote poetry, erotic poetry. Then she went to Israel and to the United States. And it's very interesting. Usually we have a lot of stereotypes when talking about Yiddish and we think that it's, it has to do with a grandmother or it has to do with older people and or it has to do with the shtetl. But what we can learn from the Belarus Yiddish poets is that actually they were uh, developing a lot of uh, modern literature that included, of course, uh, different uh, genres. And we can see that um, erotic poetry was uh, also one of the themes, like uh, erotism was, was one of the themes. There's so. plenty of Yiddish artists today that have taken many of her poems and also Anna Margolins and also uh, Kadi Molodovsky, which is the other Belarusian Yiddish writer, and, uh, and they have musicalized. Uh, if anybody wants recommendations, uh, ask Uliana or someone how to contact us or something, and we would be very happy to recommend you uh, music and musical projects based on Yiddish uh, either Yiddish poets or Yiddish or Jewish music of Belarus. Yes, and another thing that we will say about um, I think Lev is here with us. Or he Lev, yeah, Lev has just arrived. Okay, so we'll talk about Moshe Kulbak uh, as soon as he has his audio connected. But what what uh, it's also interesting about Yiddish in general is that nowadays is like a nowadays is like a contra cultural movement in the sense that. It, you get to know people from all over the world because of Yiddish and it's a, it's becoming really trendy and you can get to know artists from all over the world that are doing things with these authors and because Yiddish is like a magnet of, of different uh, interests that people may have maybe it's genealogy maybe history maybe they 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 are philologists or grammarians and they are interested in languages maybe it's the past maybe so there's so many motivations behind getting involved with Yiddish today. Uh, so it has become a, a world of very nice networking. So it's uh, it's alive, uh, and we and we use all these creations by Belarusians uh, to teach it, to keep using it, etc. So let's um, let's listen to Chlev because he's an expert on Moshe Kolbach, and he will actually share with us. Uh, part of his research. Yes, Cliff. Uh, yes, good evening, good moment, Damon and Herren, Kosovo colleagues. I'm sorry for some technical problems and thanks to Liana to, to join me again. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to say that this year I did my research on uh, Moshe Kulbach's novel, The Zilmi Nanner. Uh, the family saga, uh, and uh, I thought that uh, the majority of our today's um, uh, listeners will be Russian people and those who know Russian, but uh, never mind, my presentation will be more in English. So, can I screen share my presentation, Liana, Nick? Let's just make you a co host so that you can do that. Uh, uh, yes, yes, please. Mm -hmm. Ульяна, ты умеешь это делать? Ага, yes, I see. Thank you very much. Uh, so, do you see anything? Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great. 
So, uh, my research is dedicated to novel by Moshe Kulbak, Zilminianer, and it is deeply linguistic. It's not about uh, Moshe Kulbak, but about uh, vocabulary and phraseological units that uh, uh, that uh, we have in this um, novel. First of all, it is Zilminianer. The first publication was in 1931 in Yiddish, and uh, I also researched the Russian uh, translation, uh, which was done by uh, Rahil Baumvol in 1960. So, first of all, we studied uh, uh, culturally marked or ethno-marked lexical units. So, lexical units the, which uh, denote notions, things that are uh, that are referred to Jewish culture. Yeah, and. Um, when doing this research, we chose uh, we chose 83 culturally marked lexical units and 32 phraseological units. Uh, what were the aims of our of our research? First of all, to build the copies of uh, culturally marked lexical and phraseological units by continuous sampling from the original text of the novel, uh, then to find out the semantic features, just the sense of culturally marked lexical and phraseological units in Yiddish. Uh, then to build the thematic classification of culturally marked lexical and phraseological units in Yiddish, and uh, to find out possible ways of translation. It was one of the main aims of this research because I'm a, uh, a, an English teacher at the Minsk State Linguistic University and I'm teaching translation from English into Russian and vice versa. That's why it's my it's my own interest in this in this work. So first of all, I would like to uh, show you the diagram of uh, categories of uh, lexical units. Here you can see personal names, uh, uh, um, uh, local cuisine dishes, uh, even the names of letters of Jewish language like Aleph, uh, Gimel, Dalet, uh, Lamed, uh, then names of musical instruments, professions, uh, uh, appearance, uh, uh, some names of uh, religious uh, rituals, ceremonies, and uh, some things of uh, church attributes. So. First of all, um, personal names, just names and surnames of the novel's characters, just 37.3%. So here we can meet um, masculine names like Jude, Iche, Pole, Bere, Zische. So here you can see Yiddish and Russian translation as well. Also, um, um, uh, uh, women, women names like Hesse, uh, Sorebashe, Gite, Hene, Neche, uh, both uh, full names like Bendet, Esther, Haim, Falcon, short names uh, like Bashe, Honi, Doni, Hene, Heme. Uh, also, we observed um, forms of polite, uh, po polite forms like Reb Zalmel, because Reb, it's like a form of polite addressing to uh, to uh, adult person, uh, to adult people of uh, masculine adult people. Also, nominations of jobs like Mende der Garber, Mende Kazhevnik, Iche der Schneider, Iche Partnoi, Zish der Perhaps, perhaps it will be interesting uh, just for the professions to translate to them what are these professions. So, a bit of them coming them coming uh, slide. Uh huh. Yeah, and also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also diminutives, just like pet names, you know, Malkele, Chayele, Motele, Tsalke, Berele, because Le or Ele, this is a suffix which makes uh, pet names from full forms of names. Also, we observed uh, nominations of dishes of local cuisine. These were uh, just like uh, connotative lexical units. Uh, these are uh, notions that uh, we can meet both in Yiddish and Russian culture, for example, red wine, for example, example, egg or just herring, herring in Yiddish. Also, kartoffelstickel, uh, hale, lekkich, fischbulbe. These are um, uh, non-equivalent lexical units. These uh, are notions which have no equivalence in Russian, but uh, they were in Yiddish culture. Uh, nominations of jobs also, like uh, uh, klezmer or melamed, just musician or teacher in the header. Uh, also, um, Garber, Schuster, Brookerer, Hatsev, Zegermacher. Can uh, we, uh, uh, can you go to the 
previous one. So we get to learn a little bit of Yiddish. I will, I will like everybody to learn a couple of Yiddish words. Mm -hmm. the, the, the next one, I think. The professions are very good because they are based on the novel that Lev is explaining. And certainly they are typical for set professions that Jews have. Yes. So, mm -hmm. uh, sorry for interrupting you, uh, Lev, just for everybody to be able to learn a couple of Yiddish words by the end of this session. Let's, uh, let's do a little bit of intellectual exercise, all of us. So, uh, okay, Garber. Uh, here, we find it uh, like a Garber, like a, the first like a one. Garb, like something you... What is a Garber, Lev? Uh, Garber, sh shoemaker. Shoemaker. Okay. And Schuster? Schuster. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, leather maker. Yeah, Gaba, leather maker. Yeah. And Schuster, okay. sho shoemaker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these are going to be very traditional words, also because uh, those, uh, the, the novel has to do with some traditional uh, things, right? So in other yeah. novels in Yiddish, we wouldn't find these words because that novel will be about the city and probably wouldn't, they wouldn't be talking about these words. This is a but, nice a, a nice uh, word because maybe it's more uh, friendly, it's friendlier for English speaking uh, ears, so to speak. Zegermacher. So yeah, Zegermacher, yeah, watchmaker, clockmaker. Clockmaker. Okay, yeah. so mm -hmm. at least choose one word from the list and, tr and try to learn by the end of the session and I will be asking you which word you chose. So Garber, leather maker, Schuster, Schick, Schick, Schick. is Schuss. Shoemaker, yeah, Shoemaker. Shoemaker. Mm -hmm. Brudiker. Yeah. I don't know what's Brudiker. Uh, uh, so, br br yeah, Brudiker uh, is a person who makes uh, b um, bridges, Bricks. you know? Yeah, Bricks. brick. Yeah, brick. Okay. Bridges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, very yeah, br important. Br word. Bridge builder. Bridge builder. Mm -hmm. Katsef is a Hebrew word. Uh, Katsef, yeah, butcher. Butcher. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what, one thing that we have to take into account about, uh, when we talk about Yiddish, and this is in general, is that, of course, uh, Yiddish is a Jewish language from a German... Well, you, you could explain this better, Cliff, perhaps. Mm -hmm. so sorry to interrupt. Now you can... Uh, never mind, yes. I just wanted to say that uh, part of uh, uh, Yiddish vocabulary is uh, full of uh, uh, Hebrew words, yeah? Because we know that, uh, Jew uh, that the Jewish language, that Yiddish is based on German, yeah? German grammar, German vocabulary, most of vocabulary is from German language. But uh, we have also Hebrew words, like katsep, yeah? Okay, then uh, nominations of uh, religious rituals and fasts, like pranks, Kadish, Kadesh, Neile, Mairev, Shmoy, Nesra. These are all names of pranks. And uh, the difference is, uh, for example, Marif, uh, Erev is in Hebrew evening, yeah? This is a kind of praying which uh, uh, Hebrew, uh, not, not Hebrew, but Jews usually uh, did this praying uh, in the evening, yeah. Uh, then Shiva, Bris, Nemenhal, Negelvasa, these are all names of rituals and uh, special ceremonies, uh, spiritual ceremonies. For example, uh, Nemenhale, uh, is uh, connected with the uh, with making hale, uh, naming hale separation of uh, part of dough, uh, as well. And nagel vaser is a ritual which is about washing hands in the morning. Nagel vaser, nagel nail uh, nail wa water, uh, if to be distinct in English. So then, uh, names of uh, fasts and spiritual days, Yom Noroim, Shvuis, Pesach, as we know, Passover, and nominations representing church attributes, like sources of literature, Machzer is a book with a uh, book of pranks, book full of pranks. Agode, uh, a kind of uh, a part of um, you know, a part of Pesach's uh, spiritual texts. Uh, even Weiber uh, Korben there uh, there is uh, such a vocabulary unit which we found in this novel. Just a book for book um, uh, which uh, has uh, pranks for women and uh, Talmud Gemore in this. Text text. And names of attributes, Talias, Kito, Mizrech, Mizuze. And also words related to synagogue, uh, Besmedrash, just the name of synagogue in Yiddish, one of the words, uh, Rov and Gawin. 
Uh, also, I would like to speak about phraseological units that we had in this novel. Uh, also, we had uh, phraseological units with the dishes uh, of local cuisine, uh, letters of uh, Jewish language, names of musical instruments, nominations of jobs, uh, appearance, uh, religious rituals, uh, church attributes, for example. Three phraseological units uh, had uh, the word herring, silotka. Uh, in its, uh, for example, Kerchener Herring, Kerchenska Silotka, Kerchener Herring. This is just like um, a lazy person who lays uh, in the beach and just uh, does nothing. Or, for example, uh, the Herring of Strickel Hengen, to hang like a, like a herring. Uh, like a herring, with no motion. Повиснуть, как селедка на веревочке. And the Herring Cerysen, разорвать, как селедку, just like... Uh, like herring, uh, it's a rice, and yeah. Also, oh, I, just one second. I think it's also very important in, in order to understand the Jewish uh, culture, the Jewish folklore, the Sprichwerter, uh, the sayings are going to be something very important to understand what was surrounding them and what were the elements that they could t take to create these sayings, right? Thank you. Now it would be very good if you uh, start concluding uh, your uh, your message because uh, we need to keep uh, time and we have six minutes left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you finish your part and we just want to conclude very quickly something. Uh, yes, I just want, uh, in that case, I just want to say that uh, ways of translation, I will tell you about ways of translation one of the next time, yeah? And I'm just uh, finishing with phraseological units. Uh, for example, we had also phraseological units with names of rituals and uh, ceremonies like Shiva Zitzen, Atsidit Shiva, Seder Praven, just to celebrate Passover. Uh, names of uh, sources of literature, just Gemora Lernen to study Talmud, to read Agode. And uh, Rov. Uh, Rabonish Schweig, Rabonish Blut, Dribner Rabonish Ksav, uh, just uh, the word uh, Ravin, Rabin in phraseological units. So this was just a part of my research, and as I said earlier, uh, ways of translation, it will be one of the next time. So thank you very much uh, for people who were interested in my research and who will listen to me one of the next time. <laughs> Can you listen to me? Yeah. Uh, you're, you're joining us from, from Minsk, right? Right. And I just want to um, add how we actually met Khlev, and that's through a Yiddish acquaintance, a Yiddish friend of mine, when we were organizing for one event for the Together Plan. So we can see that uh, one of the benefits of Yiddish nowadays is that it's transnational. And that was one of the benefits of Yiddish at that time. It was uh, the transnational language of Jews from Eastern Europe. So a Jew from Minsk would be able to understand with a little bit of time, because the dialect sometimes can make things difficult, would be able to understand, to talk, and even to go to the theater in Warsaw, right? They had a different um, dialect. It's like going to Texas and trying to understand. At the beginning, it could be very, very hard, and you will say, I don't understand anything at all. But um, in general, uh, with a little bit of time, they would be able to speak that language. And that's also going to be very, very important um, for the Jewish world in general, because then they would be able to travel to the United States where there were a lot of Yiddish speakers. And then we see those um, Jewish uh, intellectuals that were traveling even to Mexico. We are, we are from Mexico, that's why we were mentioning it. And were able to talk to the Jewish community there. Klev, a Dank. I think it was very interesting. I even uh, learned a little bit more about um, um, Linguistics, I think that's very, very interesting. Uh, we're going to finish just with two things that I'm pretty sure. Ha oh, pre please raise your hand if you have heard about the D book. Have you heard about the D book? No? In Jewish folklore. Okay, tradition. Victoria has, or, oh, well, I don't know. Uh, Sue, have you heard about the D book? Yeah. Uh, we cannot listen to yeah. you, unfortunately. You're muted, but you can. You can raise your hand if you have heard about the yes, D book. Excellent, and there is a movie I'll about it. it. 
Okay, you have heard about the Dibble Tip, right? Yes. There's even a Yiddish uh, movie about that, but it's um, it's a like a kind of spirit that it's also known in um, like in in Jewish folklore in general, and it has been the Dibuk itself has been translated into English. So the Dibuk was written by Ansky, and it was a compilation of his folklore work. He went to different towns in Belarus, small towns, and he was compiling all this interesting folklore around this. The book, who is the soul of a person that has died. So, and Ansky was also a very important intellectual. He wrote a, a lot of songs for the Bund. We have the Bundist movement and was very important in, um, in Belarus. We see here a, two different groups of Bundists. The Bundist was a movement for, a, that was fighting for territorial autonomy. Uh, in uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, not territorial autonomy, I'm so sorry, for national autonomy. So they didn't want a territory for themselves, it was quite different from Zionism or from territorialism that they wanted a state and they wanted their own land. What the Bund was saying is that we want cultural autonomy to be able to have our own schools in Yiddish and for the um, Jewish workers not to be discriminated. But we also have Ariel Leviafe, who was born in Belarus, and he was. I'm I'm sorry, I'm really sorry to interrupt. We just have one minute left, so um, yes, we're going to have to wrap up in a minute. Sorry about that. Yes, exactly. I, I wanted to actually fin finish with Ariel Leviafe because he was a Zionist, and he was also born in Belarus. So we see that from different ideologies, you they were. We talked about Orthodox. The Orthodox composer, the Bundist, the Zionist, the writer. The yes, and Ariel Leib uh, Yaffe later on went to Israel and he did a. Uh, he was the first editor of Haaretz. He was uh, what, uh, an editor of Haaretz who is still being uh, published. And he was giving his speech, uh, the speeches in Yiddish. He was using Yiddish as a tool, not because he thought that Yiddish should be the language of Israel, but because that was the language that they were using and that was the language to get involved more people in the Zionist project. So, so we, we hope that uh, uh, for now, uh, we've uh, managed to at least stimulate your curiosity about Yiddish uh, if you want lessons, translations, let us know, contact Uliana, contact the Together Plan uh, and follow the Together Plan because we are working together with, uh, De with Debra and Uliana and the rest on how to integrate Yiddish into a heritage route to stand there where, where the poets, where the painters uh, worked and dreamed and read it in Yiddish and be closer to them in the language that they actually spoke and not as a simple tourist. We're tourists, we're not locals, maybe we're Litvaks, but the one thing we can do is learn a bit of Yiddish, be more familiar, be proud of our heritage and use Yiddish and Hebrew in general, Jewish languages, to build communities. Okay, so I just wanted to finish with Zai Gesund. So be well. That's one of the years. Thanks for coming. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Um, that was fantastic. Um, the next session is beginning in 10 minutes. So unfortunately, we have to wrap up, but um, it was a fantastic session. Anybody who didn't get a chance to ask a question and would like to, um, I think you can direct them to, to tomorrow on our tour through Uliana, if that's right. Yes, and you can also follow our Facebook page. Uh, if you have Facebook, it's Yiddish House London. Mm -hmm. You can also contact us there. So Yiddish House London. I'm going to have to finish the session now, but thank you all so much for coming, and hopefully we'll see some of you in the final session, which will begin at 6 o'clock. Bye, Bye, Bye,